poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Yo, what is happening, my friend? Welcome to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of EnhanceYourEdge.com, Brad Wilson. Today's guest is high-stakes cash game legend and beast, Sean Snyder. Sean is, in his own words, one of the quote-unquote poker misfits who regularly plays the biggest mixed games spread in his home city of San Diego. Sean was suggested to me by one of my favorite humans in the poker world, DGAF, and you're going to see straight away that birds of a feather flock together. Sean is brutally honest and forthcoming about his journey playing cards that will, of course, lead us down the path of drunken DGAF stories, the time Sean went broke after spending many years playing 400-800 mixed games and had to start over playing the 50 No Limit games on Ignition, and then his eventual resurgence to the high-stakes games he was born to play in. In this episode, you'll learn why tournament results can be extremely misleading, Sean's number one advice for having a sustainable poker career, besides the standard DGAF line of don't, how Sean has built up multiple six-figure bankrolls, the benefits of learning the mixed games, and much, much more. So without any further ado, I bring to you my conversation with the one-of-a-kind Sean Snyder. Sean, good afternoon, sir. Brad, it's a good one. I can't complain. It's a beautiful day in San Diego as always. Oh, San Diego. I haven't ever been to San Diego, but... Oh, you're missing out. We have we have a, a little bit of a poker resurgence, but uh, the weather is always beautiful. The food's always fantastic, and uh, unfortunately, everything's always too expensive. But other than that, there's not really too much bad you can say about San Diego. Yes, yeah, uh, DGAF's old stomping grounds, right? That's where he came up in the yeah, poker world. That's where we met back at Oceans, I think, fall of 2009. He uh, he drunkenly stepped foot into my 100, 200 limit Holden game, and uh, <laughs> how'd that work yeah. out for him? It, not not very well, not well at all. <laughs> um, his uh, his running buddy at the time very strongly recommended that he get out of the game because he was not doing well in it, and uh, it was kind of obvious he wasn't going to do well in it. It's just it, it's not a game that's very suited to his uh, live poker skills. But uh, I've always been a bit of a drinker at the table, and he was very obviously that day a bit of a drinker at the table. So we kind of just uh, became friendly, and then I realized that he was uh, he was kind of the end boss for the whole the no limit hold games rather. So uh, we always. We both kind of always closed out our own respective game and drank quite a bit together and forged a pretty good friendship over the years. Yeah, he's he's an awesome guy. I have played with him many of times with his chips all in a pile. He, he's posted some good ones recently, actually, where he ran up about that looked like about a five thousand stack in a in a two five game. So <laughs> that was very impressive to see. He had some uh, some chip architecture, some chip art or whatever you want to call it, going on. He had to get a little creative in the way he was stacking them just to make room for his chips at the table. Yeah, my memories of him are just, there's no architecture. It's full-on implosion just dim- piles, demo. Yeah. Just, just a pile of <laughs> chips um, <laughs> playing 10, 20, no limit at the commerce. Yeah, I see a lot of people do that. I do that sometimes. Maybe I learned it from him. I really, I don't know. But uh, yeah, the, the pile is a popular move among drunk people, I think. Once we can't really stack them anymore and you got to, you, gotta, you know, you got to hide your big chips sometimes in the pile for fun, especially <laughs> if you're losing. But actually, I have another good DJF drunk store. We are at Oceans with um, a very well-known recreational player who he kind of gave up on Oceans and moved to Commerce. He was playing very, very big, like 200, 400 plus no limit. And uh, DJF and I are playing three-handed 10, 20, 40 with him, I guess. They get to the river and DJF bets 5,000. I don't remember if it was chips or cash, but um, the player just says call. DJF turns over his very obvious winning hand. The dealer pushes the pot, and the player just never puts the chips in. And as the next hand is being dealt, I'm like, I'm pretty sure you didn't put it in. They had to go to the cameras, all that stuff. And 
this time I would say 90% plus it was intentional. The guy was just trying to scam him for the 5,000. Mm -hmm. That's, that's probably the dirtiest angle I've seen. And it was actually against you. Man, I've seen some, I've, I've seen some, some very interesting angles over the years. There was one at, at the matrix casino. I can't remember the exact situation, but it was a well-known recreational player playing against a well-known pro. And we we're playing 10 and a quarter, maybe mm-hmm. with a straddle. And the pro is insanely aggressive. Like, so aggressive that Garrett called the guy a psychopath, which is like, <laughs> that's really saying something. And uh, they get into this raising war, and it's like five bet or six bet. And like, mm-hmm. At the five bet, the rec puts in puts in the chips, right? The dealer announces raise, and then the pro sits there. For, I mean, it was like it, it felt like forever. It was mm-hmm. probably six or seven minutes deciding what to do, and they're probably thirty or forty k deep. And finally, the kid, the pro, puts his money in, and as soon as he as soon as he calls, the the rec instantly goes, "That's not a valid raise. Call the floor." Like he calls the floor on himself because he raised. What did he do? Oh, he he raised like exactly one quarter uh, less. Oh my gosh! Yeah, he raised exactly one quarter less than than an official oh raise. To I mean, see. there's no way the casino actually let him get that through. Is there? He got it through. He got it no. through. Incredible! Oh my gosh! I'm surprised I haven't heard about that one. Yeah, he he got it through, which was like shocking. But what's hilarious about the hand? Uh, I found it really hilarious was the pro realized what he did. Like that was why he waited seven or eight minutes because he was, he, he wanted the dealer to see it. He was worried about the, the potential angle. I mean, I would just say something if I noticed, if I was actually fair enough to notice that it was short of chip. He didn't want to give away the strength of his hand by saying like, that's that, that raises short, right? Because you wouldn't say that with aces, you know? You yeah. wouldn't be like, oh, that raise is short. That I, doesn't I count. Opposite, I would think you would say it with aces just to make sure that his bet's actually in the pot. But I would also kind of expect the casino to protect me. And like, if someone's making like a, a 12 or whatever raise, like a $1,500 raise in a twenty five fifty game, that probably there's no difference between 1475 and 1500 Absolutely but, uh, not. Right. It was just the Matrix's stupid rule. And they were like hard on it. Like they, they, they didn't, they didn't overrule it. And like, so the kid was like, yeah, I was thinking that basically if, if he had a bluff in his head, he said he was going to re-raise big. <laughs> like yeah. if he was, if he was bluffing, that's, he would have re-raised big. That's pretty incredible, actually. It, that's, uh, that's some commitment to the live aspect of the game that even I've never really thought about. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a crazy one. Yeah, it was. He, yeah, I was. I was very impressed when he was like, "Yeah, if I had a bluff, I was just going to re-raise so that he could call the <laughs> call the floor over and I could rep aces." I'm like, "Oh my god!" Like, <laughs> that's next level, sir. So, what did they end up ruling that that the guy had only called the previous raise, like the three bet or something, or the four bet? Yeah, that he just called the four bet. He didn't put the so five bet in. So they- or whatever came back, and then the other guy's re-raise came back also. Yeah, it was it was like the four bet came back. Well, the kid just called. He ended up only calling the bet. Um, okay. He had ace king suited, well, that's, that's and he ended weird. up just calling. In that case, why doesn't why doesn't it go all the way back to the other guy's bet? It seems like it's good since he didn't make a legal wager in the first place, right? Like if he made a bet that the guy could call, he should be able to. Yeah, it's a mess. It's a live poker mess. It's a live poker mess, and that's why you're not. That's why the floor shouldn't be hard and fast on these rules. Like oh, obviously, he put I mean, in. This is a very obvious situation where they should be a little more flexible and go with what the intent was either to angle or to raise. So then it should be to raise. Yeah, when he called the floor on himself, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the gig was <laughs> up on the intent. <laughs> it's, it's funny. I hear about these every once in a while. I've never really been around to witness one that brazen or disgusting. I, I respect the angle too. It just it takes like so much thought to actually get there and pull it off. That you know, as disgusting as I think it is, I do have I have some respect for it. I actually do respect that angle because like that's very well thought, yeah, thought no. out and implemented for like a, a you know a whale in the game. Like this, uh, what does he dream at night of like setting these uh, angles up in the future? So many of us have played so many hours. You think you've seen it all. When someone comes up with like a new way of to pull the wool over their eyes, I, I kind of respect it. <laughs> Oh man, Sean, how did you get involved 
playing cards in the first place. What is your what's your poker origin story? Uh, I mean, my my origin story is the same as most people my age, which is just I was a senior in high school. I saw Money Maker win the thing on ESPN, and it's pretty simple. I was I was involved in like other trading card games, Magic, Pokemon, Dragon Ball Z. When I saw Money Maker win, my first thing was he doesn't seem that smart. I think I'm kind of smart. I could do it too. If he could do it, I could do it. That was basically it. And uh, <laughs> just kind of got into the play money on Poker Stars and full tilt from there. Made my first deposit of like fifty dollars in the fall of two thousand four when I was living in Santa Barbara. And uh, I busted a couple of fifty dollar deposits, but after that, I kind of just slowly grinded it up. And I like to say I never look back, but I've looked back a bunch of times. But slowly but surely, I've gotten to more or less where I want to be. How did that career go? Santa Barbara, isn't that, that's where Brian Townsend's from too. Do you, did you have any yeah, interaction he was, with him? Uh, no, I've, I've never interacted with him outside of very briefly in World Series tournaments a couple of times. But yeah, I think he did his uh, graduate work there roughly the same time that I was doing undergrad. Jeff Madsen also, I think, was going there around the same time I did. Nice. Jeff Madsen's uh, um, another <laughs> former Chasing Poker Great and his guest. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a, interesting guy i don't know him very well but he's always seemed like he has a really good heart when i've interacted with him yeah he very very smart guy um obviously he dealt with like things that i never had to deal with in that going from a bankroll of like less than you know in in the four figures to a million dollars in like the span of a month due to a sick world series of poker run that 2004 2005 it was very early in the poker popularity i think it was at a point where I was still watching the World Series of Poker on TV. That was, yeah. The... <laughs> I think it was the Raymer year, possibly, but I remember the story being something like his grandmother gave him fifteen hundred to play an Omaha eight or better tournament or something, and he won it. And then he took his winnings from that one, played another one, and won it. I mean, that's just that's incredible. Since of all the tournaments I've played, I've never really been in a situation where I thought there was any chance I could actually win the tournament. I've never like I've never built a commanding stack where I could actually take a few hits and survive. Just kind of. I scrape by until I bust out in pretty much everyone I've ever played. So it's always interesting to hear people's success stories in tournaments. You don't play very many tournaments, do you? Though, like I saw, you, I looked you up I on Hinden, Hinden Mob. Like, yeah. So I was you got say, like twelve k. Yeah, yeah. I have played a lot more than it seems like based on the results. Um, <laughs> zero lifetime ten k caches. I've. I don't think I've played twenty, but I've played over 10 ks, and I have zero caches. I've played a ton of like the fifteen hundred and twenty five hundreds and. I'll be the first to say I just don't have the patience for the smaller ones. I don't care. I just want to build up a ton of chips and bust out. But it's, it still seems like I could get lucky and bank one now. I'm not playing terrible poker. I'm just anything that's neutral or like slightly minus EV that I think could build me a huge stack. I'm going to take it in the first day or two, basically. You sound like a cash game player. That's like yeah. a, that, that's like a very cash game player thing to say. Like if there's an edge, I'm taking it. Period. I don't care what happens. Yeah, I mean, in the in the case of me in the smaller tournament, it doesn't even need to be an edge. It just needs <laughs> to be neutral or only slightly minus and give me a chance. But when I was playing the most tournaments, it was also back when there was a ton of really good cash games. So not being in the tournament anymore had a lot of value to me. Whereas now the tournaments are kind of serious. Almost all of the high profile mixed game players play quite a few tournaments. So if there's a 10K or even some of the 1500s or smaller ones going on, it means that most of the players are in that. So there's not going to be a ton of cash anyways. So uh, the, the tournament scene is, I guess people give it more credit or value or weight now. I personally don't really, but it's also the only thing going if I'm there some of the time. So I, I try a little harder, I guess. You mean Either way, the results, the results certainly are not there. <laughs> you mean tournaments, you, you don't give as much credit to... Tournament results? Is that what you're saying? Um, I'm not saying exactly. I, I think other people value them significantly more highly than they used to 10 years ago, which just means that there aren't cash games going as much anymore. So I, I try a lot harder in them than I used to, just because it's going to be my only poker option, I guess. I still don't, I don't, I don't really value tournament results as like something that indicates you're good at poker, but I, I do try harder in them than I did years ago. Yeah, I mean... Uh, it. The variance is so huge, and also, it drives me nuts that like like on Hinden Mob, right? Like you you know your lifetime winnings are like twelve k. Yeah, I have three caches I think. But like the real result is like minus <laughs> minus one hundred and fifty k, right? Like uh, nobody nobody sees the buy ins, um, and I, that I mean, that's the problem. People are out there with two to five million in caches that probably have like one to four million in buy ins over like ten years or something. Oh, it's it's a ton of people. Like, yeah, 
like I, I've been playing like 500 NL and 200 NL on ignition right now. Um, trying to find a, a new place to p- play poker regularly online. And I'm like looking at my account and it's like just playing those stakes. You know, I have you know, 20, 25, $30,000 in money that goes through my account within like a two week period as far if you if you don't subtract the the losses <laughs> and you only look at the winnings oh, you um look like the greatest player of all time of course yeah like we you know cash game players have a hundred million dollars in winnings <laughs> if you don't subtract the losses oh, over yeah. the years I, i'm well into the I, I actually uh for the first time ever i i took my players bank transaction report from oceans 11 since it's my first year ever using players bank over a box and let me tell you, I mean, those transactions are enormous. They they add up into the millions very quickly. And I mean, if the IRS was taxing me on what my deposits were into that player's bank, I would be broke. That would just be the end of it. Yeah. It'd be my last year. Thank goodness they also obviously have the, the withdrawals and whatnot. And you can you can subtract them to get the actual result for Oceans. But yes, absolutely. It's over $2 million just in withdrawals there. Yeah, it's very deceptive. Deposit. And also, it creates this weird this paradigm of like, I don't play many tournaments. I never have. I haven't really, haven't really loved tournaments, but this weird paradigm of like playing against somebody who's somewhat well-known or even discussing strategy with them and they have millions and millions of dollars in tournament winnings. And it's like, wow, like why, how, how did this happen? You know, it's like the, sometimes there's two obvious answers. One is they ran good Two is It's just, they're losing and they just have a lot more, uh, a lot more buy-ins than they do in results. I, I would bet that the, um, the average person with $2 million in winnings is losing in tournaments probably for a lifetime. Probably right. The average person for sure. I think so if they've been like, in it for a long time. Yeah. Once you get to like the 5 million region, like I think some of those people are just kind of the beasts that are crushing, but like the one to 2 million region, I think for the most part, it's probably losing players. It's, it's easier than it seems to like just have a couple of big, big scores or whatever and just kind of fizzle out and not really do much after that in my opinion at least absolutely and speaking of these million or two million dollars in deposits and withdrawals you're a high stakes poker player where like what led you to being able to play high stakes poker for a living um as far as building your bankroll your skills I mean, so many different things have gone into it over the years, but the, the thing that made me want to do it is just that I saw Phil Ivey doing it they, on ESPN. They're saying he's one of the most respected players in the world. And I was like, you know what? Like, again, just like Moneymaker, Ivey seems a lot smarter. <laughs> so um, I was just basically like, you know what? If he could do it, I can do it. Like, there's nothing exceptional about it. He's just a person. He just works really hard. If he can do it, I can do it. So I just, I kind of did that and kept working there's been so many different tools that you could use along the way from training site videos to uh, Keo and Munker Solver and whatnot these days. That uh, As long as you're out there looking for the things that can help you improve, they are out there. But in addition to the, the technical stuff, there's also the, the live aspect of it, which I think is more and more important every single year. And uh, I kind of just, I learned. What do you mean by the, the live live aspect of it? Um, just being good for the game. That'll be a, a DJF preaching thing. Just being as good for the game as you can be, as often as you can be. I think it's on the pros. As someone who's taking money out of the game, just like Lyman would say the same thing. You are you are the casino at that point, so you need to provide something other than just showing up and playing poker. Thousand, I think, thousand I think percent. The, yeah, I think one of the worst disservices that any pro can do these days is if all they're doing is showing up and playing and then leaving with their money. I, I really... I don't think they have a place in live poker anymore, to be honest. What do you mean by that? They don't have a place. Like they're not going to be able, it's not going to be sustainable for them. Yeah. I, I just, I don't really think you can take without giving back anymore. And it, this day and age, you see a lot more of the kind of public private games with the, the people that are more willing to reciprocate. And uh, there's, there's fewer and fewer opportunities for the people who just, who treat it like a job and nothing more. So uh, there was a, a Twitter post I saw the other day where it was kind of going nuts where somebody was saying that the private games, basically, you've got to uh, debase yourself to get in the private games. And they were complaining about how they've taken over the, the poker world. What do you think about that? I mean, I've participated in a ton. I've put together games that some people probably think are along those lines. Uh, for me, for 12 years, I've kind of been in a situation where we always played those kinds of games anyways. 
the only difference was that there was a lot of other games for pros to play. So they, they just didn't really notice or care as much. To me, it's kind of just business as usual, to be honest. Like, poker hasn't really changed that much for me. So, um, yeah, it's just that the, the extra opportunities are drying up. Why do you think that is that it hasn't changed for you? So the mixed team players have always kind of been misfits in a way. Um, we would just we would agree to play strange games at strange places. Back when Hawaiian Gardens was a tent, we we play like 300, 600 mix there somewhat regularly. I think it's called the Crystal Casino. Is that the one in Compton? We played on a baccarat table. We would play 200, 400 there occasionally. My, my introduction to mixed games was at the bike when most of the games were at the Commerce. So there's there's just so few people in the player pool, and we're all still kind of eccentric that. Someone kind of has to put us all together to get us in the same place and actually agree on stuff to get the game together in the first place. And now that's, that's kind of led into both No Limit, PLO, and other games. But we've kind of always been doing it mixed to begin with. So to me, it's not that strange. What would you suggest to somebody that's maybe getting locked out of these private games or can't figure out how to get in, get in them? I mean, ask whoever's in charge of the game what they can do. But my opinion is mostly that people that are getting locked out, at least in my experience, for the most part, like they just don't seem to care, to be honest. They, they want to show up and make their money. And, you know, I, I respect the commitment to that. But if it's costing you opportunities, then probably you should be trying to figure out what you can do to adjust your behavior. Yeah, I mean, there's so there's a bunch of different sides to this. I don't think it's so like black and a black and white type of situation. Yeah, I agree 100 percent with you. Like at, at commerce, there was like a legendary, um, legendary whale who would show up and this is how insane it can get. Legendary whale shows up. He calls in to the casino in advance. Mm-hmm. There's, there was a group of four or five players who paid the floor man to contact them when that player called in. Mm-hmm. So whenever that player calls in, the floor guy calls these four, four or five guys, they show up and they just wait. They just sit around and wait for him to get there. And then when he gets it there, they sit in the game with him. And is this a no limit or PLO guy or a mixed player? No limit. No limit guy. So I, I don't really think it's that unethical for the floor to be doing what he's doing. I think it's kind of up to the recreational player to decide on his own and be like, hey, I don't want to play with these guys or I do want to play with these guys. And I, I don't think it should be up to the rec to say something to them. But if he doesn't like the way they gamble, you should probably say something. About oh, it too. they're they're all super nits, and the I, yeah. I guess the point was they did it every single time. So like that that yeah. player only played against the same group of guys, and at, over time he's like, why am I only playing against the same group of guys over and over and over I, again? I can see that one hundred percent. It's just it's got to be beyond frustrating to just watch the same people take your money over and over again. And this is what I'm saying: where like if they're not giving anything back, it becomes much more noticeable for me. Right. Like. There, there's a handful of wrecks that I can't even remember the last time I played poker with them, but I still talk to them on a regular basis. If they want to go out and get dinner, we can still go out and get dinner. Like I have actual relationships and friendships with winning players and losing players in and out of the casino. Whereas for the most part, in my experience, at least the people that are getting shut, shut out of games are just, they're all about business and they come for their money and they leave when it's, when it's gone. Yeah. Like, like, like in, in that instance that I just said, you know, uh, of course, a private game makes sense, right? You shut those guys out. You stop that predatory behavior. And it's more fun. It's more fun for the whale. It's more fun, just a, a better experience. And, and so, like I said, you know, it's not a black and white type thing. Like that, that behavior is unacceptable. And unfortunately, it just goes on and on and on until, yeah, they don't, they don't get a seat at the game anymore. Sorry. Yeah. Do like better, said, do better next time. All like San Diego and LA are very different. LA and the East Coast are very different, and they're all quite a bit different than uh, Vegas. I, I don't think there's a single game that I could play in Vegas, really, uh, as far as the private ish ones go. I, I don't think they would even consider letting me have a seat. There, there's nothing I can do. I'm not bad for the game in Vegas and good for the game in California. It's just <laughs> they, they, they've filled their quota for pros, and uh, it's unfortunate, but it's kind of hard to be too upset about. I'd like it if they would give me a chance to play in some of the games at some point, but I don't think that's very likely. And it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Yeah, just it, it is what it is. And I think that at the end of the day, the nits, a lot of the nits have, or a lot of the poker world has the nits to blame for the way that things um, have developed. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I know that I was a, a bit of a, a nit in the in the form of a, a more of a taker when I first started out. I didn't really see the forest for the trees. I, I didn't see the long term harm that my behavior could do. I remember on two plus two, we would talk about like what the best way to seat jump fish was. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine having that discussion in twenty twenty. This is this was like it was an actual strategy discussion with how to seat jump people. And like, what kind of players do you want to be on the left of or the right of? And that's just like, it's almost nauseating to think of now. Like when I see someone seat change, my, my skin just crawls a little bit. But when I see a, a pro seat change these days, I just, I think to myself, this, this is why nobody wants to play with you. Have you, um, uh, by, by strategy of seat jumping, you mean, um, like, who do you want to sit to the left of? What player exactly, type? Exactly. Yeah. What player type do you want to sit to the left of? What player type do you want to sit to the right of? The, the only time that like not seat changing would be part of the equation would be like three or four handed. Then, then it would actually be considered out of line and, and uh, angly, edge seeky. I don't really know how to say it, but yeah, only very short handed that people actually start to think that it would be something you shouldn't be doing. I remember, I hate, so I'm, I'm bringing up Garrett again, but Garrett's one of those guys that just come to mind. When Garrett would uh, go from like a must move table to another table at Commerce, like talk about sea changes. There would be like seven yeah, sea changes. What I call musical chairs. Yes, musical chairs. It's, Every- it's one of the worst things that you could see. I mean, Garrett just had to laugh all the way to the bank when they did it. But when I see a recreational player like must move and then the, the musical chairs start, then no one can figure out where they want to sit. I, I can't tell you. I would say the majority of the time I end up in the best seat. They're all trying to move to his left and they just leave the seat to my right open anyways. <laughs> but it's just it must be so embarrassing to be the recreational player and everyone's just clamoring to get like some slight edge over you guys. It's terrible to see. I hate it. I'm sure it fed right into Garrett's ego. Like just knowing that all of these guys are so fucking afraid of him that nobody wants him to be on their left. Like it's it's kind of funny in the case of the pro (laughs) that they're they're trying so hard to be in position against him. Yeah, which basically means that Garrett would sit on my left a lot (laughs) because I would not like (laughs) I would not do it. I'm I'm like I'm making a stand. I'm not moving because of another player sitting down at the game. Plenty of players that saw you not seat change that respected you for it, I'm sure. It's it's probably made you money to this day. (laughs) One of those unquantifiable things. Yeah. Yeah. At Um, least I think so. What is up, my loyal Chasing Poker Greatness listener? Coach Brad here, and I just wanted to take a moment to ask you a simple question. How many times have you heard my guests and I speak passionately about the benefits of poker coaching? You get to expand your poker network, receive expert feedback you can rely on, and have your burning questions answered by a trusted mentor. Which brings me to the Poker Power Hour, a series of 100% free live one-hour poker webinars, masterclasses, and hand history breakdowns that kick off each and every Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Poker Power Hour will be led by me, Coach Brad, as well as some of your favorite Chasing Poker Greatness guests. It will be your weekly guide for helping you plug your leaks, skyrocket your poker growth, expand your network of crushers, and inevitably win more money on the green felt. The Poker Power Hour is premium content and live only. There will be no free replays or view on demand, and the content will eventually be released as paid training only. So head to EnhanceYourEdge.com, opt in to the Poker Power Hour, and get for free today what you'll have to pay for it later. Once again, to catch the Poker Power Hour every single week, head to EnhanceYourEdge.com and join the email newsletter. Now, back to the show. So on this, on your path to high stakes, right? Like how did, you know, was it linear? How, how did you get involved in like the mixed games in general? Have you just always been like a mixed games dude? I've always been very interested in them. Like I said, Phil Ivy was the thing that I wanted to emulate. So I originally built most of my thousand or $1,500 bankroll playing 25 cent, 50 cent stud eight or better in Raz on full tilt. <laughs> um, just like one $50 bonus at a time. Like, how much is a hundred bets even a hundred bets is fifty dollars <laughs> um yeah but that that was it like those were my first two games with stud games um when i first started playing mixed games on, or live rather uh Badugi and triple draw were first starting to get popular so i started playing those at like 100 200 ish live 
Um, Omaha eight or better. I think everyone gets a little bit of experience with that. If they were originally a limit poker player, when I started, there were so many more limit games in the casino than no limit games that that was just the natural choice. There were no no limit games when I started playing. Uh, like yeah, I-, I started at this Indian casino Viejas. They would have one one regular game, which was I think uh, one three with like thirty to two hundred buy in. But the, for the most part, like eight sixteen and limit hold'em was was the game that you went there to play if you're wanting to play their version of high stakes. The limit forums on two plus two were a lot more lively than the no limit forums at that time. Like everyone was into their David Glansky and Malmuth uh, books and their poker tracker and discussing the stats and whatnot. So there was a lot more data on the limit hold'em, and the limit hold'em players were kind of the first ones to be jumping into the mixed games. So it was just kind of a, a natural progression. For me to, I went from the, the mixed games where I didn't know what I was doing to limit hold them where I knew what I was doing back into the mixed games where I kind of like had a little bit more poker knowledge under my belt to play. It's also just the mixed games are more accessible than no them in PLO just because the betting structure is the same as limit hold them as well. So uh, it, it was my passion from the beginning, but it was getting decent at limit hold them that I think kind of pushed me to get interested in the mixed games, I would say. What are some some unexpected benefits of getting good at the mixed games that you found so i would say the low ball games are very very good instructors for how to play the river in pretty much any poker game they all kind of just boil down to does he have it or does he not have it there's like there's no merging of the ranges like it's just it's a yes or no question whether it's a limit triple draw game a pot limit game or a no limit single draw game and that kind of just teaches you what hands you should be calling you can pretty just easily figure out like if a pot has five bets in it and someone betting into you for one bet, you need to call with the frequency that you break even or do better. And that's very easy to figure out. You just, you know what cards are in the deck. So you say, I'm going to call 14 out of 21 times or 14 out of 16 times, depending on the size of the pot. So in the case of low ball games, I would say it has that benefit. Uh, in the case of stud games, it just it gets you to pay attention to the game, pay attention to the game flow, what's happening, what's dead that kind of thing. It, uh, it helps your live poker skills in general, I would say. So those would be the main two things. Do they have any low stakes in mixed games? Like From what I've seen, they're mostly all high stakes. They don't even spread them low. When I, when I started, like 100, 200 would be considered pretty low stakes, and 200, 400 if they really, where they really started. But these days, th- there's a lot more availability. Like At the bike, they have a 2550, which I would consider very, very small. Um, it plays very slow. A lot of the games are chop games. So this is like this is in the realm of like a 8 16 to 1530 limit hold them game which maybe like a 2 3 no limit game something like that it's it's not a terribly big game unfortunately very slow so you don't get a lot of opportunities to learn but you can kind of uh it gives you an idea of like where you want to be as far as starting hands and the basic play of the games and even at low stakes most of the games are intuitively easy enough that even very bad players aren't very bad so you can watch pretty much anyone and more or less learn a rough guideline of what you should be doing and as far as like the not there back in the day, what about the the makeup of the field in the mixed games? I mean, are, are there you know are are there the the good players in the games? Like uh, as far as like the ratio of like recreationals to the pros, I, I think part of the beauty of the game is it's really hard to tell when someone's sort of bad at something, and it's also really hard to tell when someone's sort of good at something. You have to be really really bad, and it'll stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> and I, I mean. If you're really bad, you probably know it, and you're either going to get much better very quickly, which is that, that's generally for some of the weaker players in the newer games. They'll start out terrible, and after two days, they'll be fine. If they're still terrible after months, the reality is they just don't care. They want to gamble, and they know. But yeah, it, it's very rare, and uh, it kind of creates more of a feeling of camaraderie, I would say, among the players, because even though the edge might be reasonable, it's not really easy to distinguish. That's, uh, I, I that's good for both. Whereas in No Limit, like, Especially, especially deep stacked. Especially without an ante, like you're just going to see the people winning every day. And you're going to see you're going to see, obje- see objectively players. really bad things happen. Yeah, yeah, just ter- terrible things happen to people that are not that are not fundamentally sound. Right. When you think about joy in your career playing cards, what's the first memory that comes to mind? Joy. Oh my goodness. Um. Probably my first 40 80 limit hold'em session at Oceans. I, I won between like two and five racks, so two, two to five thousand. Back then, the accepted like bankroll would be 300 big bets, which in this day and age, people would just laugh you off the end of the earth if you said that for a limit poker game. But I have, I have probably 25,000 in my name 
So I increased my bankroll between like eight and 20% that day. And I was like, wow, this is it. I'm finally, I'm at high stakes. Like all the hard work is paying off. I can do it. I can do it. Basically. That was the moment that I thought that actually I can make Boko work as a career, which is obviously stupid as a single session. But even so, it's, that's the one that sticks in my mind. It's a good memory, man. All, all, I think all the best memories of playing poker are always like right there in the beginning, right? When I, you have a breakthrough, so, you know, I remember the first time that I won like $700 in a day. Yeah. I was like over the moon, like, oh my mm-hmm. God, I won $700 today. Like it was like an insane thing that I was not used to. Like my previous yeah. best day in life was like $200 working as yeah, a server me, like, at Applebee's, right? <laughs> maybe two or three times I had won or lost over a thousand prior to starting to play 4080. So it was like, it was the first time that I won to me like a large amount of money. Right. And I agree with you. I think most people would say something early in their career, unless they have like a big tournament score at some point, in which case probably it's a big tournament score. But for cash grinders, I would guess that most of their best memories are early in their career. 100%. Listen, so I have the opposite question. When you think of pain in your poker career, what's the first memory that comes to mind? On my birthday in 2010, I was playing 400, 800 to hold them, triple draw, two game mix. And my girlfriend was playing 100, 200 to hold them, heads up against a non professional player. Um, I think I had 25% of her. And on my birthday, I think I lost 56,000 in my own game. And she lost like 25,000 to the guy heads up. And like, I just went home the most dejected human being that ever existed. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah, yeah exactly. So that, that's the. Uh, that has uh, spurred me to do my best to never play poker on my birthday. I'm not a super, <laughs> star, but I'll do everything in my power to avoid playing poker on my birthday. How did you recover from that? I mean, I assume that. You... So this was um, this was when I was having the biggest downswings of my career. Like it wasn't just a single downswing, but multiple. I had uh, probably like three two hundred and fifty to three hundred fifty dollar thousand dollar downswings in this time period, and this was probably like part of the second one. And I was not handling anything about life well. I was just, I was miserable all the time. It was like I went to commerce just to give someone 50000 every day, basically. That, that's what my life felt like. So I didn't deal with it, really. I just, I tried to look the other way, and I kind of watched my life fuck itself up around me. How did, how did you build up these bankrolls? Like, to, you know, to have a 400K downswing means that you had to have 400K, right? Like, how, yeah. how did you, how'd you build your bankroll in the first place up to being able to be alive in the poker world at this point? So I've had like two key upswings, I would say, in my poker career. One was that year, the uh, the World Series. We had really good 300, 600 limit hold'em games every single day. And I just, I've watched other pros for the decade since. I just watched them win every single hand, every single day. And for those two months during the World Series, I was that guy. I just sat down and it was like it was everyone's job to come give me money in the game. It was just, it was incredible. It was a sight to behold. Like it's limit poker. Like you're just going to lose so often on the river. And I just didn't. My hands was just always good. Like, if I got greedy and went for the extra bet, like it was right. The rare hands that I lost, I would find a way to save a bet or two. Like everything just went my way. And that was one of my big upswings. And then um, maybe a few months after starting live poker again in 2017, I had a, a decent sized upswing playing uh, 200, 400 at Hawaiian Gardens in their mixed game. But for the most part, just grinding, playing as much poker at stakes as, that I can afford as I can. You mentioned. And not be terrible with my money. You mentioned. You restarted playing live in 2017. Was there was a break yes. in there? Oh, yeah. I, I went broke. Oh, you um, you went broke. Yeah, yeah. I um, I went poker broke. I had uh, I actually had like a pretty significant bankroll. I was using to stake someone else, and I had uh, some money invested in a, a decent little portfolio. But my actual poker bankroll went to absolute zero at the beginning of or no at the end of 2012. I guess I was playing. Uh, I was playing at the Palomar, which is gone but not forgotten. We were playing 200, 400 mix every day, and I just I, I couldn't win a hand to save my life. And uh, I eventually, my mom was sick and kind of not kind of she was dying, and I, I kind of made the decision to quit poker and spend as much time with her as I could. And I had maybe thirty or forty thousand left in my name when I decided to do that. And uh, I, I just spent myself to zero, and I, I don't really regret that at all. I, I made the right decision by taking a break from poker and spending time with my family when it mattered. But um, after she passed away. I had maybe 500 cash to my name, something like that. And uh, I basically just, I borrowed a friend's ignition account and started playing 25 cent, 50 cent, no limit. So that was, that was kind of my introduction to no limit was I start, I went from 400, 800 to 25 cent, 50 cent. And uh, 
played 45,000 hands there, 50,000 hands at 100 millimet. And uh, I kind of never looked back once I hit 200 millimet and playing a ton on both ignition and uh, merge at the time. Wow. So yeah. you literally, you grinded it back up from $500. Yeah. Yep. I, I did it all over again. That's what you were doing during those five years, the five year live hiatus. Yeah. Um, I guess 20, the beginning of 2013 was when I played my last like high stakes session with the little bit of money I had left. I occasionally played like a little bit of 4080 at commerce or something like that. But for the most part, just grinding a real small online by 20, 2017, I was playing mostly 400 and 600 on ignition and 500 on merge. And, uh, I don't know if you were playing online at this time, but they changed the ignition tables from being able to select your table to just like forcing you into an anonymous table. And for the first few weeks, the games were absolutely dead. It turned out they did bounce back, but for weeks they were dead. And I was like, all I'm doing is sitting heads up against heads up throws. Like I, I, this isn't going to work. There's yeah. They, way they messed up the, they messed up their system. They actually got rid of the, the 600 and 400 tables. Right, and, and they just moved to 500 as well. Yeah, they they merged them to 500, and then like you would join the thing, and it would be like you and one guy, and you would exactly. just play Over there forever. Room. Like, yeah, it yeah. was it was shocking to me because I was like, you know, like I, I thought I would never play live poker again. Honestly, uh, maybe every once in a blue moon I would play five five at oceans, but for me, I was really happy doing what I was doing. But uh, it just it kind of came to a screeching halt. <laughs> so I just I ventured back into oceans, and I was like, I'll be happy playing 5-5 five, five here and then 5-10 south at this other casino called 7 Mile. I was like, if I can make that work, like that's fine for me. I don't need it anymore. Anyways, like two weeks later, I was playing what at the time was the big game at Ocean's 10 and a quarter, which was always 10, 25, 50. Like, I just, I can't help myself. Like if I, if I see a good game and a bigger game, like I need to be in it. Like I, I believe in myself. I, I believe like in the skills that I've built over the years. And um, <laughs> then I went to the, the World Series for the summer and I found myself at 75, 150, that eight and Omaha eight game. And I was at Bellagio playing two four mix again, and it was like I never left. Really, I went from thinking I would never play live poker again to then I was playing live poker and thought I would never play anything, but no one hold them. Just the, the same as always, really. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of feels like it was where I was meant to be since I just I naturally get drawn back to this kind of situation. How did it feel? What was the feeling going from like playing four eight mix to playing fifty no limit on ignition? So for a couple of years, I felt like an absolute piece of shit all the time. Like I just felt like I was a loser that couldn't do anything right. But um, once I was actually succeeding at the 25 cent, 50 cent, I was like, you know what, Sean, like you're good at this. Like you made some mistakes. Hopefully you can learn from them this time around. But like as soon as I was winning playing 25 cent, 50 cent, I, I kind of believed in myself that I would, I would rebuild and things would work. Mostly because at the time, it wasn't like you have to get back to playing 400, 800. It was just like, if you can be playing $1, $2, like if you just jump and stake two times, you'll be completely fine. Your life will be good. And it, I didn't really see any reason that that wouldn't be the case. Yeah, I can't imagine somebody with your poker pedigree not being able to beat like the 200 no limit no limit game yeah. on, a, on, a, on ignition, right? Got significantly tougher, I'm sure, than they were back when I was doing really well in poker. Um, but like I said, thank goodness I had access to all the tools. I, I used a friend's run at once account. I didn't own EO at the time. I don't. I think it came out in 2016, 2015. I don't recall. But as soon as it was like available, I didn't purchase it right away. But people were making videos on how to use it, and it kind of like even though you're looking at other people's examples, you can still extrapolate a lot from their examples and kind of learn what kind of approach to poker you should be having. So I, I learned a ton very early on. Like. I, I don't really know what guys playing 25 cent, 50 cent were learning, but I, I think I was at the top of the class, at least in those games. And I, I really, I struggled quite a bit, actually, when I first started getting into the four and 600 games in 2014. I'm sure I was playing and some of the guys making the videos. I know that I was actually. You were playing me them. for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember uh, Nick Howard I played with all the time and he was one of the, the biggest winners on Merge at the time. And I learned a ton from his videos. But uh, I'm thankful for the friend for letting me use the account. Uh, I'm thankful for, my, for myself for working hard, and I'm really thankful for the uh, the tools that were out there for helping me improve. Pio, it's helping other people improve too. So, kind of. I think like yeah. I always think kind of like Pio is Pio is like you said. It, it's like a sword, and I, it cuts mm -hmm. both ways. And the better your foundation of playing good poker, the more you understand about human beings. Um, mm -hmm. and the better your fundamentals are, the more useful Pio is like, yeah, you, you, I mean, it, it's very easy to give it the wrong input and get 
just terrible answers. You, you have to know what you're doing. Yeah, you absolutely do. And, and yeah. that's, that's why it's a double-edged sword, right? Like for somebody like yourself that's been, you know, you've played poker for so long, you understand these concepts, you know, you're obviously, you've played super high stakes, you're a very, you know, you're an advanced player, obviously, you're, you're world-class. For you, Pio is going to be just out of this world useful. For somebody that's kind of new, that's just randomly putting in inputs and doesn't really know why or what's happening, and is like, oh, you know, trying to create a strategy based on some random feedback they're getting, it can be extremely detrimental to their game. So for me, that, that was what put me off of purchasing it for so long, just because I already knew I had access to these videos where other people that I knew were using the correct inputs were kind of teaching me how to use it and think about, you know, some some pretty common spots in the game. I was like, you know what? There's no reason for me to purchase this and end up possibly harming myself when I'm learning so much from these videos from people who are clearly competent using the software. I had, I, I want to have Berkey on the podcast because, um, I, again, because him and I, uh, somebody else talked about Berkey and solvers. It was Nick Howard, actually, now, now yeah, that I mentioned so. it. Nick Howard and Berkey were talking about solvers, and Nick Howard was like, solver the religion of solver in the beginning used it more than almost anybody else and finally had his breaking point and he said you know berkey intuitively uh, intuitively like uh i'm not gonna say dismiss but basically minimize the effectiveness of solvers like right from the go and it made me question because i had the same reaction when i first saw a solver i went mm, that's kind of bullshit like that was my first reaction was like, yeah, what they're doing, I don't like that. Like I, I got a bad feeling about it, right? And I always wondered like, why did I feel that way? Like why did I have that that gut reaction? And then Berkey had the gut reaction too. And I really think that it's just because the way a lot of people use the solvers, it took the human element out of the game. And when you take the human element out of the game, you're not. it's not poker anymore. Like you're not – it's not useful to anybody. Uh, whether it be live or online, I 100% agree. I mean, you, you, when I was playing online, there was guys that had full the three bet of 15%, and there was guys that had full the three bet of 85%. Like, why would I be using the same PO range for both those people? Like, one guy I should just three bet every single time I'm in the small blind. The other guy I should probably look at his four bet stat and then come up with a strategy against him. I just I shouldn't be using a cookie cutter 15 or 16% or whatever from the small blind. When I when I know what the guy's tendencies are, and live, of course, is the same thing. But instead of having percents, you just have your your experience and your exactly. Intuition. And then you you go moving moving even forward, right? It's like even online on ignition that you know was anonymous before. It's anonymous now, but anonymous tables you you know you don't know who you're playing against, but you still have betting patterns. You still have timing tells. Like and the, the player pool is just going to have certain tendencies, of course. Exactly. And so, like, you, you try to remove that. You try to remove, like, a timing tell from the equation and input in Pio, and you're just going to get fucked. Like, you're... you're the, I mean, the, the, there's, there's at least one or two timing tells that are just as reliable as they get for me in online poker. And, you know, the, the PO is not going to teach you that. In the end, I think it's an incredibly valuable tool that you can learn a ton from, but it's far from the last thing that you should be using. Yeah, that that was the the lesson that I learned. I, I learned that it is valuable under the right circumstances with the right person at the controls. With the wrong person at the controls, it is like completely detrimental to their development uh, as a player. There's also player. like another kind of like a basic situation will be you're, you're in a three bet pot as the three better. It comes like seven deuce deuce or something. So people think like the solver thing is just to bet like a quarter or a third pot here on this like low paired board. Or like I can bet this with my whole range. And then I can play poker from there. But like the reality is, like if you put this situation into PO, it's actually going to have like full pot size bets also on this kind of texture because you're having like the, the nut advantage as far as or the overpair advantage as far as having all the jacks through aces where they're going to have none of the queens through aces and maybe none of the jacks depending on the position. So like I just I 100% the standard is like people are going to bet one third pot. Like that's what people do on seven two two. But the reality is that that's far from the last thing you should be doing. You, you can take a lot of different sizes. But small and very large, I would guess, would be the most common sizes. And, and you could even, like, you could even, you know, we're assuming like reg versus reg here, right? You can even throw in a situation where you have aces, kings, queens, and like you're playing against a volatile rec where it's like checking 100% of range is what you got to do because they're just going to blast yeah. off with, with their full and range. I poker aspect can just throw everything completely out the window. You said live poker? Yeah, the live poker aspect can throw everything completely out the window. For sure, because then you have other guys, right, who, whose ranger is going to be capped at tens, and you know they're not going to call a triple. 
So you exactly, you can exactly. triple your whole range against them exploitatively and just print money. But like if you put it in Pio and you're like, oh, I should be tripling with these hands. Like, no, yeah, <laughs> don't just triple with those hands. Triple with your whole range if they're way over folding. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And that's, I mean, that's pretty common in that kind of situation. And people just, they don't capitalize on it. They'll, they'll fire the first, maybe the second, like depending on what size they chose for the first, which is probably a small one. But uh, rarely will you see someone actually try to fold the overpair there. But that, that, it turns out that's something PO wouldn't try to do is like their expectation wouldn't be that you would fold pens. And, you know, it, it's kind of like a, a friend refers to it as catching knives. You have to be very careful. You do have to know your person. But when you do know your person, it's absolutely a valuable tool to have. Yeah, you're walking on thin ice. I mean, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you are playing with fire, right? Like you, th- yeah. this can blow up in your face where you do something and it's then... Really, and it's often very obvious that they have that type of hand. So you look pretty stupid when you get caught. Because you're just like, of course, they were never going to fold that. But the reality is a large portion of the players really will, yes. Ignition is amazing, too, because you can download your hands afterwards and see what everybody has, which I has been... I love that aspect of it, yeah. As that, was, that was my homework assignment, basically. Was I, would, uh, I would just copy-paste like, the hand history numbers into a little note file, and I would just look them up 24 hours later. And, and <laughs> you can make insane, some insane folds and some insane bluffs. And, there was and a was time... Awesome. Back when you and I were probably battling with each other at the 400 and 600, like I went through a phase where I was cold four betting like a motherfucker, like all the time. It's like button raises, small blind three bets. I was cold four betting probably 80% of my hands. I like early in my like 200 career, the person I was learning from, um, I think he went, he might not like have any money, <laughs> might have gone broke. But his strategy was basically to three bet any suited ace from any position. So I kind of just, I was like, I need to have a high three bet. And I'm like, an ace is a good card to have. So basically that's how I started playing when I was playing 200. But like I was three betting the right amount with a completely wrong hand, like misapplying everything. So I can uh-huh. tell you the strategy would have worked incredibly against me. And I mean, I have to think that if I was doing it, probably other people were adopting similar strategies. Yeah, well, it struck me, it struck me because like I would open jacks and like the small blind would three bet. And I would ask myself, what do I do if the, if the big blind four bets? And I'm like, man, I feel like shit. Like every yeah. time, like it's like tens, and then I'm like, God, Jackson, like this is like top of my range, and I'm feeling yeah, like shit versus a cold really four. Have such a hand, yeah. So I'm like, okay, give me the eight three off, and yeah. let's cold four bet it, and like it just goes through, and I'm like, wow, like, and, yeah. and you cold four bet small too, so you know your risk is <laughs> quite minimal to the amount of money that you pick up, and like I just was like, oh man, I was freaking cold four betting over yeah. and over and over again and since not, it's anonymous thinking why is this asshole keep cold floor betting i was like i never have anything <laughs> <laughs> people just look it up the next day they're like eight three off what the hell like yeah and the staff like we're just like 27 like 10 or something i'm like yeah sure okay that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i look like a like a normal person and then you look up yeah, like yeah. eight three off and like, you're like holy shit looks like a little strange maybe there weren't enough hands for it to converge but i, I didn't think you had the eight three off suit <laughs> <laughs> like people would sweat that, that me was one of the cool things about those tables though it's uh it opened you up to some things that you you couldn't really do like you, you could get out of line a certain amount of time kind of with you, like yeah for sure and like i would have people sweat me and they're like you know i want to have an ace or a king when i do that i'm like are you crazy like i want the small cool. blind to have an ace like i want them to have all the aces they can have yeah. in their range that they can fold yeah i think the uh the dynamic of strange anonymity of those like the anonymity but not anonymity so you could kind of use your like that one table image differently <laughs> the image which like the only being able to play four tables actually was really nice to actually be able to focus because uh when, when i played on merge i would just fire up every single table but on ignition you just you had the four and you, you kind of have to pay attention to them yeah i love the four i get diminishing returns i think more than six but i like i like having the four being able to pay attention i've, I've always been like a high uh there's a word, there's a term for it, but it's not coming to me, but a high intensity player. So I play two hours, three hours max, and then I'm spent. I need to go rejuvenate, recover, and come back. Uh, I, I tried really hard just because I was playing so small, but I needed to play a lot of hours to actually get anywhere. But I was trying really hard to play six to eight hours a day, and I found the only way that I could even come close was if I played two or three hours, two or three times, basically. Yeah, because you don't understand the... the I'm really exhausted from sitting there doing nothing. Yeah, I've talked. I've, I've gone on about this on the show multiple times too. But like you, you know, physiologically, uh, there are chess players who play a chess tournament and like they sit in a chair and do nothing, and they burn like 
or they, they lose like 25 or 30 pounds over the course of a week. And basically what people have learned, scientists have learned is like the brain is an energy hog. It uses 25% of your body's overall energy. And so when you're using it like that, so intense, you burn calories. Like it, it takes a lot I, out I of you. No idea. That's really fascinating. I mean, I would have guessed that you burn calories, of course, but never to that degree. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, that was like, because I always thought of myself as weak for only being able to play two and a half or three hours. Yeah. I'm like, why am I so weak? Like, why do I feel so spent after two and a half hours? And then Something like- Something even 10 years ago that I found true for me was I, I could sit for 48 hours playing Limit Hold'em. But if you made me play No Limit or PLO, like six hours in, I'm just, I'm exhausted. It's, it requires so much more focus on every decision. Whereas in Limit Poker, you're going to have so many automatic decisions that like intuitively I know it to be true, but it's still surprising to me just because like it feels like poker should be poker, but definitely one is much more taxing on me mentally than another. Yeah. It feels so obvious in hindsight, right? Like it feels so obvious, like, oh, because it's just more, it's a more mentally yeah, yeah. intense exercise, right? Also like. I'm, even though I've played no limit for so long now, I'm just I'm honestly not as confident. They're, the the good players are significantly better than they uh, than they used to be back when I played mixed games. So um, not only do I have to pay more attention to what I'm doing, I have to pay more attention to what other people are doing, and it, it is very exhausting. But it also makes the game very fun to have so much to think about. For sure, that's why I never like uh, the the fast play type of poker because I like I like knowing my opponent like i like getting in that game of i've played one session of my own on 200 zoom or whatever it's called that ignition and to be honest i i see the appeal it was very fun it was kind of addicting but it barely felt like poker to me yeah me neither like i i, I want the reads like i want the population reads i want to i want to mm-hmm. watch somebody when i'm not in a hand see their betting patterns and make a mental note and then use those against the guy in the future and like you never get that in a in a yeah. zoom pool I have an appreciation for the, uh, the, the Zoom type poker. It definitely, I think it has a, a good place in poker. I would be willing to give it another try, but I don't think it's, it's a form of poker for me when I have so many other options available to me. Yeah, me neither. Um, let me do. Let's let's get some lightning round questions, sir. Then I'll uh, get you out of here. You can go crush some some high stakes mix games. <laughs> uh, what's some common poker advice you hear that you completely disagree with? I mean, it would just be the uh, the reliance on solvers, I think, is uh, a little too heavy in this day and age. Yeah, that's about it. But the double-edged sword, like you said, very simple. Right. I'm with you there. If you could gift all poker players one book to read, what would that be and why? The Theory of Poker, the Sklansky book. I think it's the closest thing that there's been to like solver knowledge put into paper form. Without ever owning anything solver related, it gives you a, a very good way to think about the game. The fundamental theorem of poker is just to uh, that you would you would fuck. What is it? You know what it is. It's you always win if you never make a mistake about what your opponent. The fundamental theorem of poker is very important. I feel like Joe Biden. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's important, but I don't remember what it was exactly. But um, it also has like a, a lot of mobile examples, which was where I first learned that mobile can be very helpful. But yes, the uh, theory of poker is definitely my answer. I 100% read the theory of poker. I yeah. retained absolutely zero information from that. I think that was 2004, so that's like 16 years ago. It's it was it was very far ahead of its time. I do remember Mike Caro and chanting that you're a lucky player, a powerful force surrounds you. Um, I don't remember that. Is that part <laughs> of the book? My God, it is part of a book. Uh, he's, he's alive, hopefully. I feel like I haven't heard his name in years. He is alive. He is alive. He actually, I mean, he, he had some things, that, uh, some concepts that, that made a lot of sense to me. Um, I, you know, the law of loose wiring that he had, that was something that I really took to heart and I think has made me a lot of money over the years. I don't know if you remember that one. Well, I'm not familiar with anything about him other than he was kind of the eccentric guy that I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, he's the mad genius of poker was his, yeah, exactly. uh, his shtick. The law of loose wiring. The law of loose wiring is basically that inexperienced players don't know the action they're going to take on any given hand until they take it. So that's, that's, basically especially for limit poker, I would say that's incredibly useful advice. Yeah. It's like pocket fours under the gun. Like sometimes they fold it, sometimes they raise it and sometimes they call. They ha- they're just yeah. ran- randomly clicking buttons. That's, that's, that's a good policy. Yeah. The early button clickers. 
if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about poker, what would it be? Uh, I would just get people to try to be better for the game. Um, I, I would rather that every casino was full of beautiful low stakes, mid stakes, and high stakes games, and that uh, the player pools didn't have to become as condensed as they are. And uh, I, I really don't think poker's at the point of no return yet. I, I think people can improve and make the games better for each other still. And I, I'd really like to see that. I think live poker is going to live forever. I think there's always uh, a place for live poker. Forever. It changes a lot these days. Yeah, I see live poker changing a lot these days. And uh, I'd kind of like for it to get back to the way it was where I don't really like the the majority of higher stakes games being private games or private-ish. And I'd really like it if people could just come in and have fun with each other. Everyone just has fun with everyone. And, uh, you know, p- people can change. I've always found that the bigger stakes the games, the more fun they are. The, yes. The lower stakes the games, the more miserable they are. Mm-hmm. Um, um, my experience, of course, is uh, that mixed games are almost always fun. It's, it's very rare to find a table that's uh, not friendly with each other and very talkative. I think that's partially just the nature of limit poker, is uh, you know you're not going to get hurt too badly on any street. But PLOs often very much the same, and uh, people can be very friendly even when they're putting in 500 blinds against each other, <laughs> just because it feels like it's not that big of a decision. Whereas you know, hold them just even a even a very friendly table of people that's friendly with each other. Like there's no fun during a hand. Like everyone's very serious during a hand, and I can't really I can't really tell you why exactly. I don't I don't understand myself, but um, hold them in general in my experience is just it, it's not the same as other games. This was another Mike Caro thing going back that you always want to be in the game where people are laughing and loud and yeah. joking. Like I agree 100% with that philosophy. Yeah. You want to be in that game. You want to be the person to start that game, to start mm-hmm. um, getting people riled up, talking to people, having yeah. fun. Be the first person to put out the straddle. Like oh, I can tell you the, the only person that comes to mind that I think can create that kind of environment regularly at the smaller and medium stakes is DJF. He's just he's the only one that I've seen regularly really pull it off. It's it's hard to do and hold a man. It's hard to do. Just people people are very serious in their five five games. <laughs> he is he is a master at he that. Is, yeah. um, a master of getting shit faced and making sure everybody I was has say, fun. So sometimes the result is he gets a little too rambunctious or the whole table gets a little too rambunctious. But it's uh, it's usually a fun ride on the way there. He's an interesting guy. I, we, I, like don't want to get stuck on him, but I, I do remember. Um, one time, so I'm from the the East coast and there's a three hour time difference. So when I flew out to commerce, I, the first day I was there, I would, you know, I wake up at like 8am. So I would wake up at like 5am and it's mm-hmm. like, what the fuck do I do? And, uh, I, so I, I went to the gym and I went to the gym one morning at about 525 and there was DGAF just running on the treadmill, like a freaking Let's beast. Yeah. I was like, what the hell is this guy? I saw him two nights ago. He was shit faced with his yeah. his chips in a pile and now he's like he hitting the treadmill. No matter heart. what he does, he's got a lot of dedication to it. And <laughs> I admire that a lot, and that's why I know it's it's gonna work out for him for sure. Yeah. Well, as many pursuits are gonna work out. It, that I didn't I didn't know him that well at the time, and then like that painted him in like a different picture to me. I was like, oh wow, I you are not you are the last person I expected to be in here yeah, getting the yeah, gym yeah. hard at five thirty. Kind of like you figure like he's a mess all the time, right? Like <laughs> at no point does he ever become a functional human being. But it turns out he's just a regular guy like the rest of us underneath. That yeah, has a lot of fun at the poker table sometimes. Found found out that he, like he's got kids, and back then he was married, and like he's a family guy. And I'm like, this is so this is too weird for me. My brain can't even process uh this dude for the character so what what wisdom would you like to share to the listeners of this show who are hell-bent on realizing their poker dreams well my first advice of course would be to give up but i mean just try not to make poker your only source of income it's it's just very dangerous in this day and age like like you said i don't i don't think live poker will ever die but um people um people that talk about their win rates often romanticize things a bit and i don't think they keep the best track of their results like i know a lot of people would say they're winning a hundred an hour or something i've seen like that at two five like sure maybe after your three month upswing that's what you're winning but the reality is like you're, you're probably grinding out 30 an hour you're getting no benefits it's it's exhausting to be in the casino all the time like just in, enjoy make poker a fun game that you can beat for money and make sure other people have fun too but try, try to find something else don't want to be your only source of income like like i unfortunately have done I respect that answer. I understand yeah. that answer and I respect it. However, I want to let's 
put this perspective on it that mm-hmm. you're the person, right? You're the person that's 20 years old being told that advice. Right. Probably probably not going to resonate too well, right? I, be I, like, I, I would have ignored myself. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So if I was hell bent on this path, um, if online poker is your thing, just study as much as you can, use the tools at your disposal, whether that be uh, training site videos where you sign up for the training site, like individual packages you buy, um, purchasing or having someone teach you how to use solver software. Um, I, I think those are pretty much necessary this day and age for online poker. And for live poker, it would be play as much as you can because you're going to need a lot of volume at those stakes, but do your best to give something back to the games that you're in. Buy the round of drinks, just have fun, be social. Like it, Inevitably, it is a game. Like If you're not having fun, like you're going to be miserable for a lot of years. And if you're not having fun, other people probably aren't having fun. So, For sure. You play poker to have fun, right? You're playing a game for a living. Well, I, I, mean, I know plenty of people that don't and don't think it's a game. So that, that would be my advice. Remember, it's a game. Have fun. And unfortunately, if you're playing at the smaller to medium stakes, you're going to need to play a lot of hours. Absolutely. And uh, it just made me think of, uh, think of my conversation with Jungle Man um, a few months back where he's such a sicko that like I asked him that question and he's like, Hmm, well the advice that I would give my past self, he wouldn't listen. So like, I'm going to give the exploitative advice. Like (laughs) he just like instantly was like, no, I need to give the advice that they'll actually listen to. Uh, Hopefully people do listen and take it to heart. I hope so. I hope so. If you could erect a billboard that every poker player had to drive past, what would that say? Drink. (laughs) <laughs> yeah um that's pretty much it smile <laughs> drink so i don't know period yeah, well, yeah drink drink is an easy it makes you social whether you want to be or not so it kind of covers all the bases what's a what's your big goal current big goal is related to poker um i'm honestly more or less happy with the th- way things are right now i'm happy to play a ton of poker when there's a ton of poker to be had and i'm happy to play very little poker when there's not a lot to be had so I would. Uh, there's a part of me that wants to lie and say that I'd like to like play less poker and kind of retire. But honestly, there's still too many aspects of the game that I really enjoy, and especially the games that I'm fortunate to get to be a part of. So I, I'm just kind of happy with the way things are. Yeah, I don't. I don't need anything to change. It's a great answer, man. What's a project you're working on that's near and dear to your heart? Project that's near and dear. Nothing, honestly. Um, <laughs> you I'm, preach I'm giving to, back this whole time. Yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, I'm trying to spread 4080 limit hold'em at Ocean's Eleven again, starting in a few weeks. I don't I wouldn't say it's near and dear to my heart. But, um, <laughs> that is kind of where I got my like medium high stakes poker career started. It's a game that I enjoy very much. That's no longer available at all really in San Diego. So I, I hope I'm able to get the game going and off the ground and have fun with some of the guys that I used to have fun with ten years ago. But uh, it's it's not near and dear to me, but it, it would be fun. <laughs> Final question, dude. Where can the Chasing Poker Greatness audience find you on the World Wide Web? You can find me at Twitter at, at Sean Snyder Poker. You can find me on Facebook as Sean Snyder, probably the one with me and poker or me and my dog in the picture. And uh, that's about it. Or, of course, you can always sign up to be a DJF Patron at whatever the hell the address is and join the really fun Slack community that I'm beyond addicted to. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Twitter, Twitter is the most efficient way where you can see me rambling with my my spastic thoughts since dgaf was a fairly prominent character in this conversation i'll put all that up on the show page the uh the slack group the patreon um all of that info and it's Beautiful. been uh it's been awesome having you on man i very much appreciate it i want to do it again in the very near future for sure i would absolutely love to and uh maybe i'll catch you one day in la if i'm there anytime soon haven't been there in like four years really yeah. No. Well, hopefully I'll catch you somewhere sometime soon. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.